Okay, so thank you for joining us tonight. I really appreciate it. I appreciate you, Laura. Um, Laura and I have known each other since, I think since your debut book was announced. For so um, long. I think possibly like, 2017. Yeah. Like for some plus years, yeah. And like I saw your, your you know, debut novel, The Light Between Worlds, the announcement for it. And you guys, if you haven't yet, it's like a twist on the Narnia tale that gives Susan the story that she deserved. And so the moment I saw it, I was like, yes, please, I desperately want to read this. Um, and it was so, so good. And since then, I've just been basically obsessed with Laura's writing. So we've, you know, we've been friends and we've, like we followed each other's, you know, careers online. And this is the first time you get to be face to face. So I'm really excited. I know. It's amazing. I'm so excited. You pitch my book really, really well. You should <laughs> definitely pitch yours, too, since we're here to celebrate your book. <laughs> Sorry, I just, I was just very excited to talk about that. Um, okay, yeah, so about- I, I was going to say we can both like, you know, tell us about or tell about, oh my gosh, we can both pitch our like books that are our most recent books or the ones that are coming and the ones that are coming out. Um, and then we can get into questions. Yes, like, you should go other. first. You do your pitch. Okay. <laughs> I want to hear it. <laughs> um, so Broken Web just came out last Tuesday and is it is the sequel to Forced of Souls. This is Broken Web here. Um, the series is about a girl named Sirsha who is training to become the next royal spy. And, but when she and her best friend are ambushed, her best friend gets caught in the fire and she is killed. Um, then Sirsha somehow miraculously restores her to life. She discovers that she is a soul guide with the power to shepherd souls. And she is tasked with destroying what's known as the dead wood which is an ancient forest where the trees are possessed by vengeful spirits that are slowly devouring the kingdoms. Um, so that's Broken Web. And then in a couple months, I will have um, Pohua and the Soul Stealer, which is a middle grade book. Um, and that one is about a young girl named Pohua who's always been able to see spirits and not in like the sixth sense, I see dead people kind of way, although she does see ghosts. Um, but she can see like nature spirits or Ooh. guardian spirits, like um, like the altar and the hearth spirits or animal spirits, like her best friend, which is a cat spirit. Um, but this gift leads her to accidentally unleashing a ghost from their local haunted bridge. And as a result, this ghost steals her brother's soul. And so now Pahua has to venture into the spirit realm to retrieve him before his spirit is lost forever. You have like a real, September. you have like a theme of soul stealing going on here. <laughs> I, I like it. it. It's <laughs> creepy and I like it. <laughs> Amazing. Um, so I hadn't actually realized that the Shaman Born series was going to be a trilogy. I at first thought it was going to be a duology. So I'm super it, excited that there's going to be more. It was initially just a duology. That's, okay. that's why. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But we get yeah. the extended edition. Yes, we do. Excellent. I'm super excited. Okay. Well, I guess I will do my pitch then. I'm not going to pitch The Light Between Worlds because Laurie already pitched that for you. Um, Yes. And we've known each other for a long time at this point. And I'm so excited to actually get to talk to her sort of face to face tonight, as face to face as things get in year 2021. Really? Face to face. (laughs) Someday. Yes. So my sophomore novel is A Tree of Thorns. It's very shiny and hard to see on the computer screen. But uh, A Treason of the, a Treason of Thorns is the story of Violet Sterling, who is the daughter of a dispossessed nobleman. And her family inheritance and her legacy is this thousand year old sentient magical house that has been in her family for ages and ages and that all of her family members have been bound to. And the house is in fact dying by the time it comes into Violet's possession, but it governs the well-being of the countryside around it for hundreds of miles. So as it goes with the house, so it goes with the countryside. So Violet essentially has to figure out whether she wants to save her house at potential great cost and great risk to the land and the people around it as well, or if the house should be destroyed. So that is the story of A Treason of Thorns. And in November, I have A Rush of Wings coming out, which is a Scottish Highlands set retelling of the fairy tale, The Wild Swans. So, you know, the one with, um, she's not Eliza in my version. She's Eliza in the original. In mine, she's Rowena. But, you know, 
the one with the stinging nettles and weaving the shorts out of stinging nettles. That one, that's the one. <laughs> so those are my books. It sounds so good. I'm super excited. I read the um the chapter. Um, I think you or your publisher released like the first chapter. Yeah. So good. I'm really excited. Um, if anyone follows Laura on social media, you'll know that she just does everything. <laughs> you just like you do so much, and I'm constantly in awe. Um, I genuinely wish for you to take a week's vacation and do nothing but sit in your garden and read. But I wish good luck. <laughs> yes. But if it's all right, I was wondering if you could walk us through a day in the life of Laura Weymouth because um. Sure. So it's not always the same, but often similar. So I wake up to one or both of my children standing over top of me. They're eight (laughs) and six. You guys know Sunny and Stitch probably from the internet. I wake up to one or both of them standing over me asking for something. And then usually for like the next half hour, I kind of wake up and doze off while they ask me for more things. And then I finally get up and I give them breakfast. And then I, on a good day, go out and walk around the garden to look at my plants And on a normal day, I get on my phone or the computer and I check emails and I do social media stuff. Sometimes I combine both and put social media stuff up about my garden. And then I generally just do kind of like busy, tidy up the house things. I prep school for the day because I'm homeschooling right now. I'm asthmatic. So we decided to pull the girls from school until everyone in the family has been vaccinated. So I'm a surprise homeschooler, not something I ever planned to do, but here I am. So I prep homeschool for the day. Then I give the kids lunch because we just do better with school in the afternoon. Mornings are not a great work time for us. Then we do school for four to five hours. Then I get dinner for everybody. And usually at that point, then I just go straight back into the schoolroom slash my office. And then I write or revise for three or four hours. If my husband Tyler's here, he puts the girls to bed and I just keep going. If he's not, I take a break. I put the girls to bed and then I go back to it. So I just, yeah. It's like every minute of your day (laughs) is like already planned out. And that's just... Yeah. Wild. Yes. It's, it's quite the situation right now, but um, we'll see. Eventually they're going to go back to school and that'll be nice for them. And for me, (laughs) for everyone involved to that too. (laughs) Yes. But I have some questions for you too, because I, as I mentioned earlier, before the chat started, I just finished reading forest of souls, which I've been working my way through for a long time. And I just, I had to take it in like little bits because I love the world building and all the political intrigue so much. Um, and I'm a huge sucker for world building and for scene setting and all that sort of thing. And there are just so many gorgeous, gorgeous locations in Forest of Souls. So I was wondering if you could let us know a little bit about your world building process. Um, for Forest of Souls specifically, how I approached the world building was that I basically learned as much as I could about the world before I started writing. And that includes things like how many countries would be in the continent, the politics of each of these countries, the geography, the history, the economy, how trade would work between the countries. And it sounds like a lot because it is a lot. um, And most of it won't ever make it to the page. But if you're building like an entirely different world, and Force of Souls takes place in a secondary world. Um, yeah. All, like all the structures that are in place in the present of your book are informed by what came before and by what's mm-hmm. going around them. And so like, even if you never explain like why something is the way it is in your book, you as the author should know why it is that way. Um, for well, example, Sorry, were you going to say something? No, 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 keep going, keep okay. going. No, like, for example, the Deadwood, um, which is the forest possessed by spirits, yes. it formed centuries ago, but it has grown to become this physical barrier that's between Evelyn and these two other countries, um, which means all trade and travel between the kingdoms is by sea. Um, and then... F- Although the Deadwood like is a threat to Evelyn as well, and they need to get rid of it, it also prote- protects the country from a land invasion. So Evelyn over the centuries has built up a strong navy because if they ever go to war, it would be fought at sea. Um, and so, and like part of also the 
the it's not so much a dilemma, but it is um, a point that Sirsha has to take into consideration in the book is that even is a country that has a magical population, but it's a subjugated magical population and they're mostly human. Whereas the two other kingdoms are magical kingdoms and they're very powerful. So with the dead wood standing between them and these very powerful kingdoms, it is a barrier protecting them from these other kingdoms. And so while they need to take the dead wood down because it is killing people, it is also protecting them at the same time. So, but yeah, like, yeah, um, oh my goodness. I love <laughs> that. I love it so much. Um, you could definitely tell that you would put a ton of thought and background work into crafting the world because there would be just like these little throwaway references to things that made it feel so fully developed and so lived in where it was just like, you could tell there's so much more going on off page than we're even seeing in the story. And I just love that, that when fantasy just sort of takes a, takes on a life of its own like that, which obviously is a credit to the author. That's fantastic to me. Caution though, for other writers out there that too much world building can be a little detrimental detrimental to the actual writing process. <laughs> Cause I spent so long coming up with all this information and details that ultimately a lot of it had to be tossed out <laughs> because so much changed in the actual writing process. Yeah. So yeah, only do as much as you need to start drafting. Like for me, that's more than probably is normal for other authors because I just, I like to feel like I have a handle on the world before stepping into it. Yeah. Um, and even if like, you know, much of what I think I know will change as I'm writing it. I'm okay with that as long as I'm comfortable to like start diving in. I feel like yeah. if we could smash our world building processes together, we'd have like an actual <laughs> balanced author because I'm a reformed Wait, tell pantser. Me about yours. Yes. <laughs> well, I'm a reformed pantser. So I'm just basically making everything up as I go along. And because that I predominantly write me. historical fantasy, I can fudge stuff and just be like, well, you know, it's sort of our world. So people will figure it out. <laughs> And the thing I'm revising right now, it doesn't help that I'm also a former medieval studies student. So I will refer to things that to that me- That makes so much sense. Yeah, I refer to stuff that to me, I'm like, well, everybody knows this. Everybody knows the like name of France in the 1300s or, you know, whatever detail that I throw into the book. I'm like, people will know this. People know will know what I mean if I say Gaul or if I say Albion or- and my agent will constantly be like, Laura, no one knows what you're talking about. You have to tell us what this is. <laughs> what is the name of France in 1300? Because I feel well, like I earlier, it's, this is my, technically this is the 1300s in my book, but it's an alternate oh, okay. history. So okay. it's still referred to as Gaul and Ireland is referred to as Hibernia and okay. the Britain and Scotland are referred to as Albion. So anyway, this is, this isn't even in a rush of points. This is my 2022 book. So I shouldn't be talking <laughs> about this at all. So no, wait, can I, can I, can I ask you another question that I wanted to just yes. dovetail into really quick here, like slide in since we were talking about the Deadwood and the role that the Deadwood serves in the world of the Shaman Born trilogy. Um, it obviously just has this really complicated function, not to mention it's incredibly, amazingly creepy and just like, oh, so unsettling. I love that about it. There were just... There was this one scene at the very end of the book that wasn't, it didn't have anything to do with the dead, with the dead wood, but in the like climactic battle, I don't want to give stuff away in case people haven't read it yet, <laughs> but in the climactic battle with Saoirse and this one person that she has a climactic battle with at the end, there, there's this transformation that you wrote and I was sitting out on my <laughs> patio in the morning reading it and I just went, oh, ew, when it happened. <laughs> It was, it was so That's perfect like, creepy and off-putting and I was so excited at the same time I was like oh this is so gross I love it that's so, the perfect reaction yes I was like oh ew I love this so much but anyway I'm totally off on a tangent now because I love that part so much and wanted to talk about it but I was going to say the deadwood serves this really complicated function you can tell that there's there are all these rich complex dynamics between the nations in this world you have the whole um conflict going on between the government of Ewen and the magic users within the country so I was wondering if you could tell us a bit as well about how you approach writing political intrigue and how you keep track of all those moving pieces because to me it seems so overwhelming and you did such a good job of like conveying everything on page thank you um, I feel like it's just through 
plotting, a lot of outline, a lot of outlining. Like you're a pantser, but I'm like an aggressive outliner. <laughs> How long so, are your outlines usually? Um, I think my record is 50 pages. Oh my word, that's like a novella. Outline. I know. <laughs> uh, um, so like my stories are generally plot driven. Yes. Yours are very character driven, which I absolutely love, but mine are like more plot driven. But what drives plot? I mean, it's the character's decisions that drive the plot, right? Yes. So I would approach it by figuring out what my characters want and how their wants either intersect or oppose each other. Um, And then I have to also consider what resources these particular characters have to achieve those goals. Like Saoirse, who is an orphan and with nothing aside from her swords and a chip on her shoulder, wouldn't be able to do nearly as much as like a princess in a palace. And that's actually part of Broken Web, like Saoirse's pursuit of knowledge that isn't accessible to her and what she has to do to acquire it. Um, But yeah, I feel like most questions of plotting come down to character. What do those characters want and how do they do it? And uh, again, I keep track of that, keep track of all those various moving parts by like outlining religiously. Um, I also color coordinate all my various set plots because I'm wow. a visual person. Yes. Um, so I have like my main plot line, my, all my subplots all in different colors. So as I'm outlining, I can see at a glance, like, where certain subplots might have been dropped or where a character arc might need to be better threaded into the narrative. And yeah, so outline is the only way I avoid writing myself into a corner. <laughs> That's amazing to me because I'll just be going along and be like, well, I can tell I screwed something up, but I don't know what, so I'll just start <laughs> over again. <laughs> See, pantsers are amazing because you keep all that like narrative structure just instinctively in your head. Like, I can't do that. I have to plot it out and be like, this is arc one, this is arc two, this is arc three. I have to like, you know, and like do it that way. Whereas like pantsers will just start writing and they'll internally have that narrative structure in their head already. And that's amazing to me because I can't do that. Well, like I said, if you smashed us together, you'd have like a functional writer. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, we'd have a power writer. It a would, super it writer. would be amazing. Um... Okay, so about your books, I've been like gushing about it. I've been gushing about it like this whole time. Like your your books are character driven and like yes. there's so much going on in terms of like tone and atmosphere and like um, really emotionally wrenching things happening. But I'm wondering if like you decide what that tone is going to be before you begin writing or if you just let it unfold naturally as you are writing. And I know you said you're a pantser, so I don't know if you've already answered this. But, but yeah, I just, what's your process? I just want people to cry when they read my books. <laughs> I want them to cry. Like <laughs> in person, I'm not a super like emotional. To say that I sobbed reading yeah. The Light Between Worlds. <laughs> I sobbed. <laughs> this is always my goal. If you don't cry at some point in one of my books, I don't feel like I did my job properly. <laughs> so, which is weird because that's not the kind of thing that I gravitate towards at all. But I don't know. I just really like to make people cry. So that's usually my goal at the outset. Um, and generally, this is really weird, but generally speaking, the tone is strongly connected to a playlist that I make for the book. So like for The Light Between Worlds, there's this movie called The Village, and it has this just ethereal, haunting, gorgeous violin playlist or soundtrack. And if you listen to it, it's just like, yearning embodied like made manifest as a sound that you can hear so I listen to that throughout the entirety of writing the light between worlds so a lot of the time I just find music that really hits the right note and then it sort of writes the book for me so I have to look up that soundtrack yeah it's so beautiful and so sad and haunting and I just love it so that factors in a lot so like um building off of that like with how haunting your books are like haunting is the perfect word actually they're haunting and they're they're a little unsettling but in like a really good way uh what do you think it takes to make a story feel unsettling um for me I guess it's that I always strive to have a cathartic ending my stories it doesn't have to be a happy ending but it has to be cathartic so I think what 
really works to make a story unsettling as you're progressing towards the end is to have a very real possibility that it's not going to end that way, that it could turn out otherwise. Like, even if you know, because of the author, that it's not going to, <laughs> like, there just has to be that really real possibility that things could go very badly, very quickly. Um, and that if the author were to make, you know, even one or two slightly different narrative choices, everything would turn out wrong instead of right. I think that's a big factor is to feel like that kind of um, omnipresent atmospheric threat as a reader and whether it manifests or not, you know that it's there and that if one thing went differently, the entire ending would fall to pieces. Yeah. I don't know. Does that make sense? (laughs) It makes total sense. (laughs) And like, I actually get um, yelled at a lot when I admit this, but I, I flip to the end of the book. <laughs> oh no, I do the same thing. Okay. I do the Just same thing. Ends, Cause I'm so anxious and I'm like, yeah, the no. author's doing such a good job. Like I, I flip to the end. I'm just like, okay. <laughs> yeah. I, I can't deal with the emotional journey unless I kind of have an idea of how it's going to resolve. So I do the exact same thing. Like even if I'm reading a romance where everyone knows how they're going to end, I'm like, I just have to check to reassure myself and then I can keep reading. Okay. But so Obviously, I write things that are very character driven, as we discussed. But one thing that I've really noticed about your work that you do extremely well is writing action sequences. And those are like the bane of my existence. (laughs) I just, they're so difficult for me. And you write them so clearly. And it seems so effortlessly, like everything is blocked out, like it would be on a stage, which is bananas to me as a reader and as a writer who struggles with that. So how do you go about crafting an action sequence when you're writing? Um, I'm a really, like, like I said previously, I'm a very visual person. So I visualize how it'll play out as if mm-hmm. I'm watching something or if I'm oh. watching a fight, like a fight choreographer or whatever. I love action films, particularly period films with like swords and archers and like oh, warring yeah. kingdoms and stuff, right? And I grew up on Chinese wuxia films. Um, which are, you know, the Kung Fu, Kung Fu films, which had the best fight choreography, like, out there. Like, Western yeah. films could not, okay? Mm-hmm. So um, I approach writing action scenes by visualizing how I want the fight to play out. And then, fortunately, I've seen so many, like, fight scenes. Like, I'm not saying, like, in real life, but, like, you know, like, how I want them to be cinematic fight scenes, you know, yeah. that I can usually figure out what I want to happen, and then I just describe it as if I'm watching it on a screen. Wow. Um, and I, I think about, like, how to get the action across, like, like, creating a sense of urgency with, like, um, with, like, shorter sentences or with fewer descriptions, because a character isn't going to, like, notice the color of the grass if while they're yeah. trying to escape like a burning ship or something unless it's For like sure. actually relevant to what they're doing or to what they're thinking but yes. yeah so I, I do it by visualizing it and then describing what I'm seeing do you ever act anything out <laughs> sometimes <laughs> but I'm usually at my kitchen table yes uh it, I write at my kitchen table so I'm usually surrounded by pe- like my husband and my kids yeah. and whatever yeah. and so if I'm trying to visualize it I have had my daughter <laughs> be my like dummy amazing <laughs> but um but otherwise mostly I just sit there and like mumble to myself and like everyone yeah. is used to it so if I'm sitting there going like this or, or like going like this and like like my mouth is moving and no words are coming out like they know I'm just being me <laughs> I'm yes. not like having an episode or something yeah I love that it's interesting to me the degree to which authors tend to be a bit more method than people would believe um, because I'm the same way, but with dialogue, like, because I write a lot of books that I, that are set in the UK or in Scotland and there's a lot of regional dialect. And I always want to get like the cadence of the words right for that character. So I do all the voices and all the accents out loud when I'm writing dialogue. That. And I will only write locked in a room because I don't want anyone to hear me because it's so <laughs> embarrassing. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. So I think, I feel like there's a lot more like kind of method and doing things in, you know, meat space when you're an author than people would tend to believe where they think you're, you know, just sitting there typing, staring off into space. (laughs) Yeah. Like, um, speaking of your writing, which is so lyrical and evocative, um, like, and I think maybe part of it is how you, you 
get it or try to get it so accurate like you know the dialects and stuff like that but they're just like very evocative of like the setting and what you want to to um convey um and like much of it reads like poetry uh, so I'm I'm wondering what inspires that what inspires your writing and like maybe somewhat related like what kind of reader were you as a kid um and what were some of your favorite books so like the most painfully nerdy reader that you could imagine as a child that would be me I read like all the 18th and well not 18th 19th and 20th century like British kid lit and like <laughs> I read Tennyson for fun like just really really weird I read a ton of Victorian poets um so obviously that kind of bled into how I write things and I still love to read poetry and I think that if you want to develop like a more lyrical writing voice even as a prose writer you one of the best things that you can do is read poetry because even if you're not a poet yourself, which I'm not, I'm not a good poet. Um, I it will, you could do it. No, I don't know. <laughs> but it, it gives you, it gives you such a great appreciation and a better ear for like a lyrical turn of phrase and how to say things concisely, but beautifully. So I always recommend that people read poetry because I, I love it. And I read a fair bit of it still. I can definitely see that in your writing. Like I used to love poetry. Actually, I read like Tennyson and that stuff too, but like, I, w- I had this college course in um, about, or I was going to say this college course in college, like duh, yes. <laughs> but this course in college where um, we, it was uh, part creative writing and part poetry and like the poetry mm-hmm. unit, I was, you know, writing poetry and I used to love writing poetry, but my, the, the professor was actually just hated my poetry oh, no. and kept telling me that it was like, you know, too abstract, too abstract. Oh. And like, and then like it, it just really discouraged me to the point I haven't written poetry since. That's but, awful. And writing is yeah. so subjective. I hate when I hear stories like that about people who had like awful experiences in post-secondary education, with <laughs> creative writing teachers. I just want to shake them because, you know, it's subjective and what yeah. you don't like could be somebody's favorite thing. So, yeah. but it's, it's okay. I, I stuck with writing prose and I yes. think I'm doing okay. <laughs> yes. Luckily for all of us. Um, so if you could recommend three books to people, which three would you recommend? That's hard. Any three books whatsoever. <laughs> Any three books. Yes. That's impossible. Um, can I, I know we yours? sent yours? We sent each other questions in advance and I just like pulled this one out of left field. So Lori's not prepared. <laughs> can I recommend yours? Like, sure. is that okay? Like, <laughs> a, Trinus, a Trees of Thorns was like gorgeous and, and like creepy and unsettling, but my heart belongs to The Light Between Worlds. So I'm going to recommend The Light Between Worlds because okay. it just, it made me sob and it was so good. Yeah. Um, and then I came out of it just feeling like totally, like you said, cathartic and it was like <laughs> perfect. Um, so I love that and I would recommend that. And then I'm looking at my bookshelves right now. That's why I'm like gazing off the There distance. we go. Um, but... I also am obsessed with the book Uprooted by Naomi Novik. I still haven't read it and people keep recommending it to me. It's so good. Like it reads like an old folk tale, like, yeah. which are like, which is like my favorite sort of mm-hmm. like, um, you know, um, storytelling style. Like it mm-hmm. reads that way and it's, it's really beautiful and it also has a creepy forest in it yes. <laughs> that like you know I, I think it also devours people actually yeah um the forest in it um but yeah it's really good I love it um and then let me think hmm, hmm. I'm gonna go with something different and recommend Warcraft by Marie Lu oh, it's like a science awesome. fiction yeah like, um I don't know if you've read it but it's like not. um it's about uh like a virtual reality game that like you know people can enter and then there's like you know um murder mystery going on and lots of digital code and stuff it's like like hackers and it's very good it's so good marie lou does science fiction like so well so she writes all her books are really great but she has a specific thing i think personally for science fiction so those are my recommendations those are my recommendations <laughs> so are do you ever game are you gamer at all I do game um I play World of Warcraft <laughs> oh very nice um, and then I also play or I used to I don't play anymore I used to play Kingdom Hearts and Final Fantasy and um 
I think, and like, what is it? Monster farmer. I forget what it was called. It was a long time ago. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah. And then I do Pokemon go, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm, you know, whatever, but I don't know. Do you, I don't even know if you would have time to game. Um, but. well, I would kind of steal it right now. Cause I got very into Valheim, which like just hey. came out. And my husband was like, you have to play Valheim with me. Come play it with me. And I was like, oh, I don't know. You know, I have my other <laughs> games that I play. I was he like, well, I'm really into in. Zoo Tycoon right now. <laughs> and he was like, no. So anyway, now I enjoy it, I think, more than he does. And sort of took off and stole all his stuff and started my own world. Yes. But um, <laughs> yeah, so I do I do game. I like the old school. Like, I love Icewind Dale. I love Baldur's Gate. I just want to go on an adventure in a, a different world and have it be beautiful. I played Oblivion. I haven't gotten around to Skyrim yet, but I would like to. So I've heard really good things about Skyrim. I would like to do that. And like, I would yeah. like to play The Witcher. Yeah. You know, these days. Yeah. Okay. Same question for you though. So now you've thrown it at me, like three books. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, yours, obviously, Forest of Souls, because it was so like deliciously creepy. If you like that sort of thing and not, you don't have to be a horror aficionado because I'm a big weenie. So I don't like anything really scary, scary, but I do like, you know, a little bit like dark and edgy and, you know, just skin crawling, creepy. And Lori nailed that with Forest of Souls, as I referenced earlier with my OU that I <laughs> let out during the final scene. And just the Deadwood feels so um, ominous and brooding and the way that it consumes people is fantastic so definitely definitely pick up forest of souls and pick up broken web sequel to forest of souls um and then okay so this is really really unrelated to ya but i read this book at the beginning of the year called becoming wild by carl safina i think i'm saying that right um i read a lot of nonfiction, strangely and this book is about animal cultures and about the cultural legacy that animals pass down to each other in the wild. So he profiles oh. a community of sperm whales, one of macaws and one of chimpanzees, and talks about what their cultures look like, how they inherit it, um, and what it looks like for animals to maintain their cultural legacy in a world where humans are constantly encroaching on their habitat. And it was just really beautifully written and fascinating and very accessible. So I really recommend that book, even though it's probably a bit out there for anybody tuning in who's an avid YA I think it reader. Fascinating! I love it's, like um, nature documentaries. Yeah, so me too. I That's like that. my go-to comfort <laughs> watching. I just yeah. want to have David Attenborough whisper to me about yes. elephants or something. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so that one. And then since we discussed poetry before, there's a book called Devotions by Mary Oliver, and it's sort of like a compendium of her some of like her poetic highlights, you know, what's that even called when you do like the best of somebody's work? I don't I'm remember. not sure. I don't know. We should know the word because we're authors, but whatever. Right. You know. So anyway, <laughs> yeah. the book we'll called Devotions by Mary that. Oliver. It's really great. You should read it. Um, she's a poet and does much better with words than I do. Uh, so <laughs> that would be my other recommendation. I always find that hard to believe, but. Oh, it's true. Wait, I think I had another question for you. I just have to look at my phone because okay. I'm dependent on my notes um I'm the same oh I really really wanted to ask you this one who is your favorite character from the shaman born trilogy to write and why and what would the two of you do if you were able to spend the day together my favorite character to write is Van yay okay I was hoping you'd say so because I love him he, he's you can always be assured that he's got something obnoxious to say yes <laughs> he's like perpetually grumpy because he just has such high expectations of others and himself and no one's ever measuring up <laughs> so he's really fun to write um but like I don't know if that I would want to spend any time with him <laughs> like even if I wanted to spend the day with him he'd probably nope out of it after like an hour or something because he can open shadow gates that like transport him from one place to another like almost instantly so yes. he can make himself scarce like that <laughs> well you two can portal to my house and do something uh, with me because I would love to spend the day with him and am um, a fellow perfectionist who oh, loves it would have people. to be during the day then if we yes. like because then he he can't do any sort of that magic mm -hmm. during the day so yes that'd be perfect we oh I'm so glad you us. picked him because he was one of my absolute <laughs> favorites he is just such an old grum 
I love it. Yes, I'm so glad you like him. I'm, I'm yes. glad people have like accepted him because I was just like, he's kind of a jerk. Hopefully people will like him. <laughs> no, those are my favorites. <laughs> in real life, I'd be like, please stop speaking to me. But in fiction, Agreed. I love the jerks. <laughs> Um, let's see. I am looking at, okay. There was one more question I wanted to ask you, which was about okay. setting. Um, they like your settings, they don't just feel real. They feel like present, like I'm fully informed. And like your characters love these places, like the woodlands and the light between worlds or like Burley house. Am I pronouncing that right? Burley yes, house yeah. in A Tree's of Thorns, which was really its own character, but because you do such a good job like manifesting their love for these places on the page the reader can't help but fall in love with them as well so I'm curious what your approach is with how you go about doing that like crafting a setting that readers will just love and yearn for so that is 100% wish fulfillment I immigrated from Canada to the United States I lived in like 18 houses by the time I got married uh, my dad is an immigrant. My maternal grandparents were immigrants. My great grandparents on my dad's side of the family were immigrants. Like if I chart the progression of my family, I am the sixth consecutive generation to immigrate from one country to another. And that's only because I lost track going that far back. So there is like no sense of this is where I belong in my family history. Um, and so that's why I love to write books where somebody absolutely fundamentally knows where they belong and has really imprinted on a specific place. Because for me, it's that wish fulfillment of I would love to have this in my life, but it's just never going to happen. So I love writing about that sense of belonging because I like to imagine what it would feel like. And yeah. okay, I did have one one extra question that I wanted to ask you, which is only okay. like tangentially book related, but it is related <laughs> to settings and places and belonging. We've been talking about houses lately, because I know you're in the process of potentially making a move. So I wanted you to describe your dream house to me. So I love hearing people talk about their dream houses. Hmm, my dream house. Dream property as well is fun. <laughs> you know those like paintings I forget yeah. like who the author is, or, or the artist is and I, I should know but they, they, they do like these really quaint paintings of like cottages surrounded by flower gardens and like there's a bridge a stone bridge arcing over like a little river or whatever and just like it's like so, so gorgeous like that's yes. my dream house <laughs> it's like a little single story cottage with like flowering vines growing up the walls that's yes. warm and cozy like lots oh, of bookshelves and like yeah my own office space. I would love to live like also on partially wooded land that's mm. like overgrown with wildflowers because I just like I have this image in my head and yes. just like I want that and like like you said I'm, I'm currently like house hunting we have a accepted offer on our house so we really have to find a place otherwise I will not have anywhere to go yeah um, but we were we were looking at this house and like um the, the land was only like a little bit of wooded space like at the edges of the land mm -hmm. but there was this natural space lined with trees all around and like natural mm -hmm. sizes like some were big and some were like these saplings and it was beautiful yeah and like like in the middle the ground was just covered with ivy mm -hmm. and it was gorgeous I <laughs> and I that. could like I could picture myself out there like with a hammock yeah. or a gazebo or and I just I felt instantly in love with it mm -hmm. like um uh, unfortunately I wasn't in love with the house um, oh dear and yes. it was also right next to a highway Oh, so yeah. it's very loud and a motorcycle drove past and we we're just like, <laughs> well. um, yeah. but, but yeah, I was absolutely obsessed with that little patch of ivy surrounded by trees. And oh, like, I would wonderful. love to find something like that. Just like the right balance of like wooded for me. Cause I want to live, like, I want to be like a witch in the forest. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I understand. My that. husband wants manicured land to like, actually like be able to do stuff on. Yes. <laughs> so, like, who wants to do that? I just want to sit in my woods. <laughs> yeah. But, sure. yeah, so. Yeah. Oh. All right. I think we're going to be taking questions. Yes. You are going to be taking questions. <laughs> and I have rarely heard a conversation, and I use the word crackle. <laughs> like, this <laughs> conversation has crackled with not only uh, wit and admiration, but a deep uh, reverence. 
variety. And so I want to thank you both for bringing the best to author events. If anybody says, oh, virtual, uh, <laughs> they need to watch this author event because oh, thank you. Lori <laughs> and Laura, you have brought it to our audience this evening. Uh, please do a master class on how to do the author event because you brought it here to us this evening. One of the questions that we have for you uh, both is, when did you know, or when could you say to yourself, I'm a writer? Oh gosh, I feel like that's hard because I went through so many stages of like imposter syndrome and that never goes away. Like um, I've been writing for as long as I can remember. Like I've known since I was like eight that I wanted to be a writer. Um, but like, so I would call myself a writer and even after I got published, I would hesitate to call myself an author. And that, that was like fully just like in my head, like me, me having the imposter syndrome. So like I'm a writer, but then I feel like, like it's too much. Like I'm being pompous by saying I'm an author, you know, which get over it. You know what I mean? Like, like you, you're I'm like you, Laura, and like me and other authors, we're not here incidentally, you know, like we worked hard to get where we are. Like we spent a lot, lots and lots of hours like sitting in the dark by ourselves, you know, working oh on goodness. these books and pouring our hearts into these books. And wow. we deserve to call ourselves, you know, authors and not be like um, embarrassed or like um, not feel like we're not, we're, we're not good enough, you know? Absolutely. But, so it's like, for me, at least it's a constant struggle to like get over that hump in my head of, stop selling yourself short. Yeah. Um, I, for me, I have a similar story. I've been a writer pretty much all my life. Like in second grade, I wrote this short story called a night's lament about this knight, Sir Peddington, who travels off to fight a dragon and is slain in battle with the dragon, but it's like a long lingering death. And he's <laughs> laying on his deathbed saying that he wishes he'd never become a knight and had settled down and led a quiet life and married his childhood love interest which I wrote in second grade, of course, as you do. And pretty much the end of that story, I was like, I think this is me. I think this is the thing that I'm going to do. And I did not have that conception of you can do it as a career yet. And really it did not become my career goal until suddenly I had this like six month old infant, my, my oldest. And I was like, well, I'm a college dropout. I'd really like to be able to work from home. There's not that much I can do besides this weird skill I've been honing for the past 20 years. So I guess I'm going to make it work. <laughs> um, and then I became. That's a power move right there. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, that is definitely the power move. And <laughs> I think we, uh, you're right. It is easy in this business to, uh, Lori, to sell yourself short and to, to kind of like try to tamp down your accomplishments. But, uh, uh, I'm glad you, I'm glad you say it loud and proud, nonetheless. Still Go trying. Ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> yes. Keep trying. Keep and trying. one, one like little pro tip that I have for you in that instance, Lori, is pick like one thing that happened with your writing that you're really proud of, and then use it as something that you tell people every time you say that you're an author, like if they ask a follow-up question. The Light Between Worlds was picked as one of the Times of London's best books of 2018. I tell people that all the time, like <laughs> insufferably, because it makes me feel fancy and like I'm, you know, yeah. legitimate at what I do. So I pick, I pick one thing that makes me feel like, wow, I'm good at this. And then I just, I tell people. <laughs> I love that. That's a great tip. <laughs> yes. Choose your flex, choose your flex and use it indiscriminately. <laughs> well, okay. Where, okay. Ultimately there needs to be a podcast where the two of you are together. Right. And, and talking about all these things, but giving pro tips. Uh, Lori's website has got amazing suggestions for writers and advice. And I strongly recommend taking a look at that. And so that leads me to something I was thinking about. The two of you are so inspiring. And when you ask that question, Laura, of Lori about your ideal house, or, you know, I was thinking, of course, of the classic Rebecca and Manderley right uh, which is a character no doubt in this in this amazing romantic suspenseful thriller so 
Uh, where do you draw, uh, Lori and Laura, where do you draw inspiration in the real world? Um, <clears throat> a lot of my books now are inspired by my culture. Um, like Broken, Forest of Souls was the first time I allowed myself to write parts of my culture into the story like um I grew up like you know reading you know all the fantasy books that were the classics that were the ones that were available and um largely they were um white <laughs> so yeah. like uh they were western you know fantasies and the characters were um predominantly white and if they were not then they were like portrayed as that stranger from a distant land you know yeah. like someone who was very clearly other someone who mm -hmm. didn't belong in those stories um so I used fantasy as a way to like retreat into like you know from like the world where like I didn't quite fit in here but if that I, if I could change myself I could fit into those fantasy worlds and it took a really long time for me to dismantle that because that's like you know really uh that was really harmful to me as a kid yeah. um and my and my like self-identity but like so now you know I I allow myself to pull from little bits of my own culture um into my and put it into my books um because that would have been that would have meant the world to me as a kid seeing you know pieces of like the real me in these fantasy worlds and that's part of why I you know made the choice to make the characters in Force of Souls Asian because Force of Souls I wouldn't call it an Asian fantasy it's just a fantasy where the characters happen to be Asian and there are some elements in it that might be inspired from my culture because I wanted like a traditional traditional um mainstream fantasy that where the Asian-ness was just incidental. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't like where we just belonged there, where we just fit there. Like it, it wasn't, there wasn't a reason for it. We didn't need to justify us being there. Us being there, like, like this is a fantasy world because, you know, it's inspired by Asia. Like, no, it's just a fantasy world mm -hmm. where the characters are Asian. So, um, so yeah, that's, that was the inspiration for like um, Force of Souls and Broken Web. And then um, Pahua and the Soul Stealer, which is the one coming out in September. That is, this is the first book where um, the character is very plainly Hmong, like, which is what I am. Like um, I've never written a Hmong character before other than like, um, like a short story I had done mm -hmm. in one of the anthologies, but it gave me the courage to write Pahua, which is like, holy and fully like Hmong it's like um which is not something I've ever done before so so yeah <laughs> Laura what about you um, what inspiration do you find in the real world um it's really kind of piecemeal for me I am like I mentioned before a former medieval studies student so I love history and I draw a lot from history as you can tell because I write primarily historical fantasy at this point but also I don't, there's just little things like the house in A Treason of Thorns, Burley House is based on an actual um, house that I saw in a magazine. Uh, it's one of the Prince of Wales estates, I think. And I saw it in the English Garden magazine and it just had this very inviting, friendly looking facade. And I was like, what if this house could talk? What if this house, you know, had a, um, a, a equivalent relationship with the people who lived within it what if they weren't just watching the house and living in the house but it was doing the same for them so that was the inspiration for Burley House and there's just you know little things that sometimes will spark an idea for me like I was taking my dog for a walk one day and watching him you know bound along through the long grass in front of me and I was thinking about my family and you know my family history of immigrating from place to place and thinking about how the women in my family could be characterized as the women who went I was like, well, what if I were walking along in the wake of my dog and I was one of those women who went, where would I be going? What would that phrase mean to me? And that sparked the entire storyline for A Treason of Thorns, which is my 2022 release, or not A Treason of Thorns, sorry, A Consuming Fire. Too many books. Um, but uh, that sparked the idea of this girl who goes on a long journey across the country to a specific end and 
you know, if you want to read the synopsis, you can go on my website to do that. But uh, so just different things that I encounter in life. I'm obsessed with your brain. No, <laughs> it's scary. You don't want to go there. <laughs> Again, if if the two of you are not going to give us more of this collaboration <laughs> via, via just Zoom so we can just hear you <laughs> converse, then please put it down in writing. Do your own collaborations uh, because it's it's truly... I don't know. I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm fascinated by it. And I, I want to thank you both for, I mean, what a, what an incredible conversation. Well, another question, what drew you to, to writing fantasy? Have you ever thought about writing any, any, any other genre or maybe you have? Um, like, what was it about fantasy? Um, like my, the earliest, <laughs> the earliest stories that like I was told are like called Deneng, which is like oral Hmong um, folk tales. So my mother and my brother would tell me these and they were typically supernatural stories, like about ghosts and spirits. And like, <laughs> I was very obsessed with like the macabre as a kid. So like we would have gotten along. <laughs> yeah kids. and like so I read <laughs> that that branched off to me reading like a lot of horror like Arl Stein like the Fear Street series and things like that and like my my earliest stories like I was like you like I was like in elementary school and I was reading or I was writing short stories about like these kids who would fall in love and then die gruesomely being killed by ghosts you know <laughs> so like I just I was just always drawn to the speculative I just um and 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 maybe part of it was like self like wish fulfillment you know like because I wasn't it wasn't like the happiest in terms of like my real life um so you know those stories were my way of like escaping and like retreating out of what was I guess out of me like you know what I was experiencing in real life but um but yeah and then I read um The Hobbit of course yes. I read The Hobbit the and gateway book. like <laughs> yes that's the gateway book and I I was just so swept away and I and I knew instantly that this is what I wanted to be able to do with my writing because I was I was just so obsessed and so drawn in and like so sucked into that world that I was just like it would be amazing for me to be able to do this for like other people um so that's sort of what drew me into fantasy and then um I've written sci-fi um I have a sci-fi short story in a thousand beginnings and endings and like a sci-fi um book that I am hoping will eventually be a published thing um but I would also love to write horror one day <laughs> like speculative horror though yeah like, not just like but yeah that would be really cool and and I would also love to try my hand at contemporary but that's really hard I find contemporary really difficult to write oh I love that I'm kind of the opposite of you when it comes to why I very first initially was drawn to fantasy so I grew up in like an evangelical adjacent church in the 90s which was like the satanic panic so anything with magic in it was evil and from the devil and you could not read it or watch it like we weren't allowed to watch the magic school bus because it was magic so <laughs> and my mom I'm is so probably sad watching this right Laura. now and she is always like I'm sorry I did that to you but um <laughs> Anyway, it worked out well because I became a fantasy author because the forbidden fruit tastes the sweetest. So <laughs> there, <laughs> there actually weren't a super lot of books that I wasn't allowed to read because I was like a pr very prodigious reader and would just argue circles around my parents about why I should be allowed to read this book and why censorship is evil. But um, so, but it was just the fact that everyone was saying, no, this is bad and you shouldn't do this. And I was like, oh, but are you sure? So that made fantasy very alluring. And I started again, read The Hobbit. That was one of my gateway books and just went on to love YA fantasy in particular. Our children's librarian at our library had like just made the library's first YA section when I turned about 12 and she brought me over to it. And I still think that I'm like 50% of the reason why she made it. <laughs> and she brought me over to it and was like, here, here are some books for you. <laughs> and I just loved it. And that's been my passion as far as reading goes for a long, long time. And weirdly though, the first full length novel that I ever finished at age 19 was a contemporary. And I'm currently working on like a revisited version of it. 
So I do write other things, but fantasy is my first and greatest love. Well, Agreed. Lori, as we're wrapping up this evening, can you give us a little, I know you uh, mentioned that, of course, you've got, uh, and I hope I don't mispronounce it, Pawa and the Soul Stealer. Yes. Um, and are you working on something else? Right now I am working on the final book in the Shaman Born trilogy. Um, it's taken me excessively long, but I am working on it. <laughs> um and hopefully I'll get that back to my editor soon but um I'm excited about that and then um after that I will start working on the next book in the okay. series too but at least you can close because if you were some big name authors that I won't actually name you would just never finish your series so <laughs> It's funny you say that because my first series was like sold as a duology, but mm -hmm. like Gates of Thunder and Stone and the Infinite, it was a duology, but I intended it for it to be a trilogy. So the second book ends on a slight cliffhanger and it's currently unfinished for like five, six years. And the amazing thing is that I still get readers asking, when am I going to finish it? And I oh feel awful God. every time because, and I'm yeah. going to finish it. I fully intend to finish it. Yeah. It's just that I have to work on the contract books first. So, Well, yeah, the ones you get paid for, for sure. But yeah. So, well, sorry. That, uh, <laughs> you know, that's a real compliment when readers are coming back and saying, oh, you know, when, when, where's the next one coming? And I think that's a testament to your power as an amazing writer. And in this author event, um, I hope that just people who are watching us tonight or the two of you uh, pitch this as a series uh, for something on Netflix. Because <laughs> we, we need the two of you with your candor, enthusiasm, uh, your depth of knowledge and your commitment to the craft to bring more stories to us and inspire others uh, to, to do what you do and to think very deeply about uh, the worlds that you created and uh, the cultures that you bring to us to uh, help us understand better uh, what, uh, what we need to know about not just this world, but the many worlds. So I want to thank you uh, both so much and I want to congratulate Lorian Lee uh, on her latest book, Broken Web. And I'm delighted that she was in almost, I, I guess, her sole conversant, uh, Laura Weymouth, this evening. Uh, thank you again for being here and uh, many hearty congratulations, Lori. And uh, we look forward to seeing you both again. Thank you for sharing your time with us this evening. Thank Good you. Night, thank everybody. you so much thank for you having, having me. Us.